it's my honor to come here. And in fact, this is my first trip to India after 2018. So I mean, it's a long char cherished trip back to my home country. And it's also my first time in Bangalore. So thanks Shubra for inviting me here. So I'll be talking about uh, probing emergent behavior in Kitab quantum spin liquids. I am, a, well, it's saying, while it says that I'm in Oak Ridge National Lab, I have an affiliation with Oak Ridge National Lab, but uh, right now I'm based at Purdue University where I have my group. Uh, so the, the talk that I will be presenting um, as an outline, I'll be talking about the spin phases of matter, quantum spin liquids and neutron scattering, which I think Bella Lake had already given a lot of introduction to, but I'll also touch up on that in case you have missed that. I'll be talking more about GitHub spin liquids and what are the expectations here and then the material progresses and uh, some of the data that we are getting. And if I have some time, I will be talking about how we are thinking of programming the spin states of matter on quantum machines. So uh, this work has been done by, um, uh, I mean, it's a big group of collaborators uh, with uh, Steve Nagler, Colin Sarkis uh, uh, playing a main role, then David Mandrews, Christian Batista, Alan Tennant, and then we also have Berkeley and then from uh, Max Planck Institute, we also have Johannes Canale and uh, Roger Schmersner, with whom we are actually interacting quite a bit to understand the data. And then Barry Wynn has been helping us a lot with uh, actually taking the data at high fields. So um, um, to jump into what uh, exactly we are interested in, I mean, we are interested in the spin states of matter. And uh, of course, uh, spin states of matter has been uh, in technical relevance for a very long time because they are used to make this magnetic memories. And that actually depended on this one uh, defining principle that uh, if you, you have a ferromagnet and if you have one spin which points in one direction, it kind of starts to pull the other spins in the same direction as well. And then all the spins in that direction. So it uh, so you, even if so, even if you basically scramble one spin, uh, it had the overall the uh, memory of the system doesn't really change because it has a tendency to come back. So this is a, a sense of protection which is kind of built built in into the system, which is kind of protected by an energy barrier, which has made um, these magnetic memories and this technological revolution really possible. But that's not the only state of matter. There are other phases of matter like skirmion, spin I, spin liquids, and then emergent defect domain world. So there is a huge play field that we have uh, that we can work with. For example, we can look at valence bond entangled systems like valence bond solids or resonant balance bond systems and definitely about quantum spin liquids where we have very long range quantum interactions which are where you can basically get these topological states uh, that I will be talking about quite a bit. So um, a lot of introduction has been done on quantum spin liquids but for, uh, uh, I'll just not dwell a long time on it but uh, it's basically a state of matter where all the spins are, they look disordered if you take a snapshot. However, um, I mean, uh, the, the reason the spins are disordered is not because the spins are not interacting like in a paramagnet or not interacting in that energy scale like in a paramagnet. The spins are actually very strongly interacting, but they still fail to order because of quantum fluctuations and uh, gives rise to a highly degenerate ground states, the dynamics. But what we know is that in spin liquids, uh, unlike in a paramagnet, the motions are, of the spins are actually very important. So it's, it's just like if you throw a stone in water, you will, um, all the molecules in the water are all uh, scrambled. I mean, they're all moving in random directions, but if you throw a stone in the water, you still form waves, which is very regular. So that's uh, how I try to think of quantum spin liquids. What it means is that the dynamics and measurement of the dynamics in uh, spin liquids are actually very important. And these dynamics are often topological in nature because they can have like this vortex, anti-vortex like states, this flux states and quasi particles and uh, and uh, the other thing is that the spins actually lose their individual character completely and you only have like dimer coverings and long range dimer coverings or triplets or quadruplet states um, in the system. So uh, there are several platforms in which you can reach uh, quantum spin liquids um, and they have been covered in a lot of detail here. Geometric frustration, well, of course, you can also have a make, you can have exchange frustration. I'll be talking about this today. Pyrochlores, you have a mixture of kind of both, and then you can also have network, frustrated networks like Trassi, Sunderland, and many others. Uh, I will be mostly talking about the exchange frustration. And uh, 
And there has been a lot of effort that has been spent in figuring out what is actually the topological nature of uh, these uh, emergent systems. And um, you can actually have, oops, um, I mean, you can have gap Z, Z2 topology, which has anionic spin-ons, gapless Z2, which is like emergent photons or monopoles. You can have a direct U1 spin liquid, which basically has a new one symmetry with direct fermions, and then you can have a spin-on Fermi surface with spin, spin metal. So it, it, it has all been uh, kind of recorded by Lucille Severi and Leon Balance uh, in 2017 paper. The main reason why I'm, I'm talking about this is to get the take-home message that each kind of these quantum spin liquid topologies actually have a characteristic dynamics, and it produces different kinds of quasi-particles with different symmetries. And uh, and uh, of them, the gap spin liquids and the bound states are actually highly soft after, sought after for reasons that it can protect quantum information. So how do we really measure these in real life? Um, so what we really measure is the dynamic spin-spin correlation, which is uh, this term right here between two spins, which is uh, alpha and beta. Uh, so there are several ways in which you can measure it. You can measure the Fourier transform of the, I mean, neutron scattering measures it. You, have, you can do Raman, you can do resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, NMR terahertz, many others, which measures this quantity. But what we don't really have as a tool in the community is uh, more sophisticated quantum observables such as multi-spin correlators or loop operators or, or, um, or measurements that can really give you an idea of what is the entanglement entropy of the system. We don't have that and maybe developing some of these would be very, very, very welcome. I mean, we heard some uh, great talks today, uh, great talks yesterday, um, Andrew Zeledev and, uh, um, and others where we were talking about the, um, uh, the, um, the electrostatic measurements. I'm sorry, missing my words. I think that some of, some of those uh, where you can basically get the four spin correlators, I think that some of those are very important. So in neutron scattering, of course, uh, neutrons basically have a mass, so they have a de Broglie wavelength. So the Fourier, so basically when it scatters, you basically get the atomic correlations from that, so you can look at the phonons. However, neutrons also have a magnetic moment. So, in, so, the, so the neutrons, the spins of the neutrons interacts with the spins of the material, so we can also get the spin-spin correlations from there, and the Fourier transform of that is what we really measure. So we get two information at the same time. I mean, we get both the phonons at high Q, and we get the magnetic information at low Q. So if we get like these terabytes of data from one single neutron scattering experiment, and then we basically take that data and we slice it up into several Q vectors, and uh, we look at the high Q vectors for looking at the phonons and the low Q vectors for the um, magnetic information. So if I break up the overall uh, scattering cross-section, it uh, basically has some constants then the magnetic form factor is important because that's how we really know uh, what is magnetic and what is not. So anything which falls off uh, like the magnetic form factor must be magnetic. And then we have some selection rules which tells you which direction the spins are pointing and which direction the spins are fluctuating. That's also extremely important because that's also an information that we get right from here is which direction the spins are pointing and fluctuating. But the important term is the Fourier transform of the spin-spin correlation function that we measure. So, which is up here in red. So most of the measurements that I've been, I will show are actually done in the Spolish and neutron source in the beautiful mountains of Tennessee. I hope you visit there sometime. And um, basically, I will not go into the details of how we do it. There, there is also the proposal for the second target station, which is gonna come up there. Uh, it's starting to get built. And uh, I mean, so we have a lot of, we will have a lot of neutrons for the next two or three or four years because they will be upgrading some systems. But then after that, we will hopefully have a lot of neutrons. The uh, ESS will hopefully all, also be online. So exciting times. So, um, so uh, much of the measurements that we, I will show basically is done in this uh, instrument right here, which kind of is on a dance floor. It's a very plain floor. And uh, this is a two-ton system of detectors. This is where your sample sits in uh, 
um, cryostat and you have this graphite drum, which is, has a monochromator, your sample sits here in a cryostat and it reflects the neutrons to a bunch of helium-3 detectors, which are actually uh, at the uh, behind. And this whole drum kind of rotates on, the, on this floor. Um, so if you want to look at the phonons, we look, take it to high Q. And if you try to look at the spins, we'll take it to low Q. And that's how we do the measurements. And uh, so that's the incoming beam. We have the port in Tesla split, split coil magnet here. And then we have this hovercraft. And this is how um, um, the crystals that we are measuring, they look the alpha ruthenium trichloride crystals. That's the one in black, it's 1.4 grams. Uh, which we have to kind of really strongly put in an aluminum mount because uh, if you don't do that, when you apply a field, the crystal flies. So that's something that we have to worry about. And then the way we do it is that we then, uh, the detector is only two dimensional. So basically you get the two dimensional data from there. But uh, in order to get the third dimension, so we have both HK and L, what we do is that we basically rotate the crystal um, progressively. And then we kind of stitch together all the data in uh, a big data set, which has all the three-dimensional information. And, and um, the time of flight, so how much time the neutron takes to go from the sample to the detector pretty much tells you how fast the neutron is going, hence we can look at the... Uh, uh, so uh, I'm not going into too much details on how conventional magnets look. You get magnons, and uh, then uh, if you have a fluctuating moment, um, so maybe just a little bit. In conventional magnets, basically, we get these magnons, which look like these uh, ring-like shapes. This is some in-plane in -plane scattering in some sample. As you could see that you have these conical structures, and they are very sharp. So, um, and, uh, so uh, these are the parabolas that you would get from a conventional antiferromagnet. And as you see that, depending on what energy you make the cut, you basically get these round-like shapes. Uh, which are pretty sharp. Uh, but uh, that's not how uh, fluctuating order looks. So fluctuating order means that they have a small lifetime. And things which have a small lifetime, if you Fourier transform something which has a small lifetime, it would look broad in energy. And similarly, if you have uh, orders which are short range order, they will look broad in the momentum space because of the Fourier transformation and vice versa. So that's what we are really looking for are this fluctuating short range order moments and uh, of course that has been shown to be the case for example in many systems um, by now for example uh, both in like antiferromagnetic spin chain where you have the spin on deconfinements and then there you basically get this uh, uh, broad scattering uh, continua which is kind of sandwiched between this uh, two envelopes one coming from the ferromagnet the other coming from the antiferromagnet has been shown and also in uh, the triangular lattice quantum spin liquids in Herbert Schmidt. So that brings me, with that introduction, I think that I can talk about uh, the Kitaf quantum spin liquids, which uh, we have been working on quite a bit and uh, has also been covered in the talks by Lucas Janssen, Rosa Valenti, Perkins, Natasha, and uh, Yuji. And uh, so, the, so I will not again spend a lot of time on it, but essentially what we have is that we have three Ising interactions we're on this Y-like motif. And uh, what is happening to the spin in the middle is that the spin is actually completely frustrated about which direction it wants to point. And now you take that Y motif and you extrapolate it, you get a honeycomb lattice. All the spins here are frustrated. And it turns out that the ground state is actually a quantum spin liquid, which is basically a superposition of all these uh, Ising dimers. Uh, it was uh, really the brilliance of uh, Alexei Kitaev uh, he was able to actually solve this directly by uh, writing this entire Hamiltonian just in the basis of uh, Marana fermions, both localized. I think I switched the notations here, but sorry about that. Basically, what he found is that there is an emergent um, conserved uh, emergent flux sector, a Z2, so there is an emergent Z2 symmetry, and hence uh, that helped him to write it down just in the basis of Marana fermions, and uh, he was able to kind of solve this. And uh, what he, uh, so the way I kind of think of the, the solution, so basically, no, sorry. So the excitations of this model are these fundamental quasi particles, Marana fermions, but there are really two types of excitations the iteran Marana fermions, which are gapless, and then the vortices or the fluxes, 
which are gapped. And these are the fusion rules that you get from there. So the way I understand it is that you basically get these vortices, which are like breaking of these Ising dimers in this tandem uh, in loops. And, uh, and if the loops are kind of joined, you get these fluxes. But when you basically take a scissor and break that loop, so that's the excitation on top of it, you basically get two Marana fermions from top of it, which are now fleeting. They can basically travel anywhere. And uh, so closed loops are these Pisons, and open loops are these Marana fermions. Now, what he also showed is that uh, if you apply, so uh, if you don't apply a magnetic field, if you're in the completely isotropic point, which is right in the middle of the triangle, you basically get the gapless, uh, uh, Marana, uh, you basically get the gapless direct cone type uh, dispersions in uh, the Marana fermion sector. And then when you are um, applying a, uh, when you are out of the, uh, when you're actually uh, in the anisotropic limit, then basically you can gap it out. But you can also gap it out by applying a, a magnetic field, and uh, that also opens up a gap right at the direct point. And uh, what he showed is that uh, you basically get uh, four super selection sectors there. One is the gapped bulk bosons, the gapped emergent marina fermions. You get the gapless edge modes, which are the half quantized chiral marana edge states. Uh, which are right here bridging those uh, cones. And uh, you also get the bulk capped Ising non abelian anions. And that was very exciting because uh, that basically opens up one way you can get to topological quantum computation, what he was really interested in. And, uh, and turns out that uh, these uh, edge modes basically don't carry any uh, charge or spin, but they carry heat. And uh, whenever you, and the churn number is non-zero, so it will always possess this gapless chiral edge modes if this, um, uh, if, a, if you can find a material that can do it. So the, so you can actually get the signatures of these uh, excitations in both neutrons and using, uh, uh, using thermal transport, which people have done. So we started working on KITAF quantum spin liquids, uh, ruthenium trichloride, and uh, of course, uh, George Jackali and Guinea at uh, seminal paper was very important for us to really figure out which materials we should target. And uh, these are materials. Uh, so basically you have to have this um, honeycomb lattice where you um, have this octahedral cage of anions. And what happens is that the uh, Heisenberg isotropic interactions cancel out to just leave you the Kitab interactions. And then uh, people went on and they basically made a host of these materials, including ourselves. But what we find is that, uh, I mean, we, we spent like two years uh, in the lab making a material, another group spends three years. We spend so much time and effort and these materials order. We go to the lab, we make the material and, and then it orders. It's not a quantum spin liquid. So then that begs us the question that is proximate spin liquid really good enough. And the reason why the order is because you have all these uh, symmetry allowed terms in the Hamiltonian, which is this uh, Heisenberg term, this off diagonal term, so on and so forth. Then you can't really avoid that in a real system. I mean, you are always away from the exactly solved point. So the, theoretic, the theoretical challenge is that quantum Monte Carlo doesn't also work there. So it, it, there is always this mismatch that, uh, uh, I mean, what we really get in a material with what, the, where the theory wants to be. And so then the question is that, is um, approximate spin liquid good enough? So uh, there, so with, to answer that question, uh, there are two classes of materials have been really studied, sodium iridate, where uh, they basically showed that you have strong bond directional interactions. And then we started working on alpha ruthenium trichloride. Uh, uh, first measurements were in powder, where we started seeing uh, some of these uh, uh, scattering spectra. And um, it, it took us actually a long time to get this material correct. In fact, we spent like two years in chemistry labs to really get the right material, which let us grow very nice single crystals, one gram, two gram. Um, so this material has strong spin orbit coupling, which is one of the prerequisites, is a nice moth insulator. And uh, this material also is, uh, uh, it's inert, which means that it's a relatively inert, which means that uh, you can just leave the material on the table, nothing will happen to it for a long time, and you can exfoliate it just like graphene, which is a very, very nice uh, feature to have. 
So what we uh, did was neutron scattering, where um, in neutron scattering, we measured the, this is intensity versus energy at um, uh, temperature less than nil temperature and temperatures greater than nil temperature. What we found is that at temperatures less than nil temperature, we see this uh, spin wave modes marked as sitting on top of a continuum and above the nil temperature, you just have the continuum of scattering, which is, uh, this is L versus K. So you, you see this rod like scattering spectra, which means that you, I mean, this continuum is mostly confined in each plane. So even if you have a 3D material, really, it doesn't really matter, you, you're still all in plane. And if you look at the in-plane scattering, essentially, you, if you squint your eyes, you can see a star here, a star here, a star here. It kind of starts to match the pure um calculation, not quite, I'm at low energies, basically. Uh, what we find is that you can do a very simple RPA, in fact, Johannes Knolle here sitting, uh, you can do a very simple RPA, and then you can think that, okay, you're starting to see what the spectrum looks like, so you might be simply connected to the Kitai phase. So the, the, these measurements were also done by Shuang Hong Do uh, in Nature Physics, where they also showed that uh, this is their spectrum that they got. This is the pure Kitav, um, and the pure Kitav calculation. And at high energies, you match. At low energies, there are always differences because of other interactions. Uh, but at high energies, you kind of match uh, pretty well. So. Um, so one, one thing that I want to go uh, forward, uh, tell you before I get to the next point, is that the spin quantization axis of this material is very important, and that was one of the mistakes which the community was making. Essentially, the spin quantization axis are fixed by the ligand direction. So the spin quantization axis is along this chlorine, ruthenium chlorine ligand bonds, and they kind of come out of plane. So there is actually a translation between the spin quantization axis or the Ising axis and the space group. So the space group does not define the spin quantization axis in the system. And that will become very important very soon because that was what was used by Yokoi et al. in their science paper to figure out which direction you would have a churn number of plus one and which direction you might get a churn number of minus one. Really, what happens is that you see this uh, uh, ruthenium chlorine, ruthenium chlorine bonds, and uh, they actually, these are actually like squares, even though they don't look like squares in the projection that I've shown here, they are really squares. And uh, so basically, um, the, the uh, Ising interactions basically come out of these squares. They're kind of, they're perpendicular out of these squares. So it, essentially you have three of them all along those three bonds. And that's how the Kitav uh, Hamiltonian pretty much gets. And those are the three quantization axes that you get in the system. So uh, with that understanding, what we did was that we, uh, it was easy for us to apply the field in the direction, in, in an in-plane direction, which mind you, it's not along one of the spin quantization axis directions, but it is kind of, so we applied a field in the direction where you should get this turn number equal to minus one, that's the A axis. What you also find is that along the B axis, yeah, the turn number is zero, which means that you should get, you should expect like gapless states there and you should expect like gap states right here if you apply a field along in the middle of these red and blue regimes uh, in this material. So in order to see what happens, we applied a field first, it was easy for us to apply a field in plane, it's just the experimental constraints. What we find is that at eight Tesla, you not only kill the uh, long range order in ruthenium chloride, what you have is that uh, you basically go through, a, so what we found is that at low energies and low temper, at low, at low fields and low energies, sorry, at low fields and low energies, you have this magnons, which are these, uh, I told you about the um, parabolic like states, which is sitting on this uh, continuum of spin-ons, which is this cloudy feature. Here. And what we find at six Tesla is that it seems that the gap completely closes and the magnons basically start to vanish, while at eight Tesla the magnons have completely vanished and leaving behind what looks like a gapped uh, spin liquid phase with uh, a continuum of scattering right here. And which really made us wonder is that the gap which was proposed by Alexei Kitaev, right? 
here is that the gap that we are seeing here. So that was really um, what we thought was the interesting question. So, and, uh, and very soon after that, we, there was uh, this paper by Kasahara and Yuji Matsuda, basically showing that you basically, uh, at 8 Tesla, you see a half quantized uh, uh, plateau, which I, we know that the results are very debated, but uh, uh, that's what they saw, which uh, seems to be very consistent with the picture that we just uh, saw here. I mean, if uh, we are lucky, that's the picture. Well, um, um, so what they found is that you see this half quantized, uh, half integer quantized plateau right at eight Tesla, almost up to five Kelvin, which is uh, actually a very high temperature. And uh, eventual results by, uh, also by Yuko Deshimoto and another group, basically confirmed uh, what was proposed by Liu and Norman in their PRL paper is that, uh, which shows which direction you should get a gapped and which direction you would get a gap less. Uh, uh, so the directions in which you, you expect to not have a gap, which is field along B direction and this white regimes, they showed that you don't get a KX, you don't get a thermal hall plateau, but in the other directions you do. So that was uh, nice to see. But uh, as I was mentioning, there is a, actually a huge amount of debate. Uh, essentially there are groups, um, I mean, Yuji Matsuda's group basically shows that you have this half quantized plateau while it's kind of moved to 10 to 12 Tesla in Yokoi's science paper, Bruin, the Bruin paper, which is the Max Planck group, uh, says that, okay, um, the half quantized plateau is at 12 or 13 Tesla, which is right here. Here is where we kind of see like this plateauing like behavior. And uh, then none of that matches uh, some of the measurements of thermal conductance in our sample samples by Nai Fong Ong's group in uh, uh, Princeton, where basically uh, we see what we think are very regular quantum oscillations. Now, uh, Max Planck group doesn't believe that these are quantum oscillations. They see, think that these are phase transitions, while we are, we think that look, these are like, look very regular. So we, there is a whole debate right here, and there might be differences in some, uh, we are trying to see if there are differences in samples which uh, are leading to this. But anyways, we, uh, st we are actually uh, pushed on to see, understand the material better. And uh, using um, AC susceptibility, what we found is that we've tried to understand what these phases are between. So we found that between six and seven Tesla, there is this nice phase, which has like two kinks in the AC susceptibility, was measured by beautiful data by uh, Paige Kelly. And uh, for some time, we wondered if that's the phase which, uh, where you should see this um, quantum spin liquid behavior, but it was not that, uh, as we figured out. What we found is that this, using uh, an instrument called Corelli, which is a Laue diffractometer, what we found is that you have a new magnetic order kind of coming up there just right at that phase. So that's actually a long range ordered phase. So this, this is a phase where we really don't have any long range order, which is beyond 7.3 or 7.5 uh, Tesla. So that's probably the more interesting phase. And uh, then uh, Christian Baltz measured the data at flex all the way up to 18 Tesla. And what he figured out are these magnon modes at zero Tesla and at 13.5 Tesla, you also see the magnon modes, but close to eight Tesla, is where he saw this bright continuum. And uh, he was not able to really uh, say whether these are gapped or gapless, but that's what uh, he could measure. So if, if, if he actually, so he, so, oops. If he actually kind of superpose that data on top of uh, the AC susceptibility data, what we find is that this is where you start to see the bright continuum is where you start to see this other zigzag phase. And then at uh, here, you also see the bright continuum, um, which spills beyond the, all the zigzag phases. So that kind of tells you what the whole phase diagram looks like. And, um, and if you superpose that on top of Kasahara's phase diagram, what we find is that, oops, that's your zigzag phase right there. And that's where he expects a half quantized thermal hall plateau and, uh, and uh, so that uh, tells you that you have one phase here, uh, an ordered phase here, a second ordered phase here, then the half quantized plateau, and then you have some kind of a third ordered phase at high fields. 
So we were, uh, so we tried to probe more whether we have gapped or gapless excitations. Now, the data that we got from high spec some time back, energy versus in-plane scattering, it seems that it points to a gap, but there are several other reports in literature which basically say, hey, this might be gapped, this might be gapless. There is a paper which came up in Chinese physics letters just a month ago which says that it's all gapless. So, um, and so some papers say that it's gapped, some papers say that it's gapless, but for the thermal uh, Hall plateau to exist, we should expect gapped behavior. So we try to see if we can really understand what is going on here. And in order to do that, so we have a controversial picture of what the gap already is. And if you have heard Yuji Matsuda's talk, I mean, he also alluded to this controversy. So there is also these new results on the heat capacity data, also I think from a very similar group by Tanaka, which was published in Nature Physics this year, where they showed that uh, if you apply a field, so they basically look at the gap as a function of field directions in the sample, so in-plane field directions in the sample. And what they find is that for certain in-plane field directions, you see a gap, so that's along h parallel to a, you see a gap. And then when, you're h parallel, when you have h parallel to b, which are those white, so let me actually see if I can find that, oops. Uh, oh, I don't have that, um, sorry. Uh, so what they found is that uh, when you apply a field h parallel to a, where you, your churn number should be finite, there, there is where you see like a, uh, like a gap behavior, like an excited behavior. Sorry, yeah, and uh, where you have h parallel to b, it kind of slowly kind of extrapolates to zero, almost gapless. So um, the question, and uh, they, they kind of summed up that behavior in this plot here, where you have churn number minus one, you see a gap, you have churn number plus one, you see a gap, but when churn number is zero, where you have the transition, you don't see the gap, and was published in Nature Physics, and uh, that's a hallmark of quantum QSL, sorry, uh, of the Kitev QSL, but then the question was that, can we settle it with neutrons? Turns out that, and, and that's something that we have been doing. Kiran was, is my first graduate student to join me uh, when I joined Purdue, and uh, with her we have been taking some of this data set. So essentially, this is the data that we took at high spec, where this is um, the data at uh, 7.3 Tesla, 8 Tesla, 10 Tesla, uh, 11 Tesla, 12 Tesla, and 13.5 Tesla, what we find is that we basically see this, uh, we don't see any magnons right here. It's basically a cloudy uh, scattering spectra, uh, which is completely deconfined. And it kind of remains that way almost until 10 Tesla, where, which is where you start to see this magnon-like feature appearing. So there is a kind of a progressive, uh, so if you're coming from the high, high uh, field side to the low field side, what we have, so this is basically, we are applying a field along h parallel to a. So this is field along h parallel to a, by the way. So what if you come from the high field side to low field side, it's almost like you have a magnon mode which slowly melts there and melts to form this uh, continuum of scattering right around a Tesla is what we see. And this is uh, kind, of, kind of pretty remarkable uh, that we see that. And, uh, but then we try to understand, okay, is this gapped or is this not gapped? Now, this is not background subtracted, but turns out that background subtraction is uh, actually extremely necessary here. So for high fields, of course, we don't need to go through any background subtraction. We can clearly see that we have a gapped mode, which at 10 Tesla, the gap is roughly 1.5 MeV. At 11, it's roughly 1.7. At 12, it's roughly 2 MeV. So on, and so on and so forth. But at low fields, which is 7.3 and 8, which is kind of a very interesting regime, we were trying to understand, okay, is that really gapped or is that really not gapped? But, but the problem that we have here is this elastic line, which comes from the fact that chlorine is a very, very large incoherent scatterer. So that's one of the problems. The other problem is, of course, that uh, you are sitting in, inside a magnet. So the magnet gives you a huge amount of background. So so there was, we have to really find out ways to kind of subtract, uh, hopefully both of them, but at least one. So what, what we went through is, um, not going into too much details, what we went through is a, a pretty elaborate uh, enterprise of trying to figure out how to subtract the background. 
what we were doing is that we were taking 13.5 Tesla as our background. So let me show that to you once again. So what we assume is that 13 Tesla or 13.5 Tesla, this is clean, which means that now we can take this data as the background right here to see whether these are gapped or gapless or whether the modes are closing there. So that's basically what we, uh, what we are going through here. And uh, what we find, so at uh, high fields, of course, we can fit it to a gap where you have basically, you subtract the 13.5 Tesla data. So it looks like you have no scattering right here. And then you have this rise of a mode. Uh, so this uh, inflection point is where, what you call the gap. But uh, can we do the same thing for the 7.3 and 8 Tesla data, which I have zoomed here? Can we say for certain that it is gapped? So and that's basically uh, the, what we are going through right now. And uh, can we fit it to something like that? And we have gone through a huge amount of analysis to figure out what kind of cuts we should make, how broad our cuts should be, and a whole error, error analysis on top of that, which I can go into detail if you're interested. But uh, this is what our fine, and we also subtracted the 11 Tesla data to see if, what we've used that as a background. And uh, what we have is uh, one of the plots that we have right now is that the gap versus field uh, right now looks like this. So it seems that 7.3 Tesla, it's kind of iffy, but uh, eight Tesla onwards, it seems that it's gapped and it kind of rises as a function of field. So we also took uh, data for H parallel to B. How much time do I have left? Two, three minutes, okay. So um, essentially, uh, we also took data for H parallel to B, uh, which is the other direction where, where you should not expect a gap. And, and, and here also at seven Tesla, we see this uh, cloudy modes and uh, no long range orders. So, that is very reminiscent of having a spin, spin liquid state. And then what happens is that as you apply a field to 10 Tesla, this new mode kind of starts to kind of coalesce and develop. So this is a very fresh data. I mean, I, we took this data basically in Ju end of July. So, um, and, but uh, this we thought is remarkable. What is almost happening is that you have this continuum of scattering and that's getting slowly pushed to a mode, which is kind of building up right here. So, uh, uh, but really to figure out whether it's gapped or gapless, it seems that uh, there is a, the continuum is still there um, at eight, uh, eight Tesla, whether it's gapped or gapless here, it's hard to say right now because um, we'll see how, what the analysis uh, tells us. But I think we are also designing new instrument, a new instrument, which is a spin echo spectrometer based on a spin echo technique where we will try to see um, Oh, sorry, that was a different thing. Not for that was not for our UCL three, but uh, but uh, we, we what, what we are trying to see is, think is um, uh, we are trying to see what we can do in order to see whether there is a gap there or not. So what tricks we can use. So uh, for the future challenges, of course, Yuji Matsuda threw us this challenge that look sam there is significant sample to sample variation maybe. So maybe uh, there is. Uh, uh, the Bridgman samples are different from the CVT growth samples and annealing time matters, the KXX values matter. So that's a whole slew of challenges that we have to figure out material wise. And uh, then I can also discuss uh, if I have time or if you're interested, some of the spin hole measurements that we are doing on exfoliated samples of ruthenium trichloride on platinum, where we are using platinum as a proxy to measure the states in ruthenium trichloride. And what we see is that we can track where the phase transitions are, and we Sorry, also Anup. see like um, uh, seven. Sorry, Anup, if you want yeah. some questions, I think we need to come. All right. To so, all right. So, with that, I think uh, uh, so this is the second last slide. We still have to answer the question is proximate spin liquid good enough? And uh, with that, oops, I will just uh, go to my final slide. Oops. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, yeah, presentation, also the, the new data. So the uh, talk is open for discussion. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you, Harnap, for this really nice talk. So uh, if I understood correctly, 
you do see a gap in this intermediate uh, uh, field phase. You, you see a gap in one direction, and in the other one, you tend to say there is no gap, right? Or... I don't tend to say anything yet. Okay. I only tend to say that um, we got the data, and okay. we are trying to see if it is possible to say something. Okay, but this would be in line with the, the uh, heat capacity measurements, right? Where, where they are more sure about that. My question is, uh, so this is also in line, of course, with the theory for the pure Kitayo model. My question is, how, mu how much would this ch picture be changed by additional terms, which we know that are present in this material and are not negligible? So would you expect uh, gapless and gap behavior for these directions or not? Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, that's basically the question that uh, we don't know the answer to is, uh, we know that the Kitab interactions are the strongest, but is that good enough? I mean, does that mean that the Kitab interactions basically overwhelm all the other interactions and kind of only express itself or we have other interactions playing games with us and what we really don't have is a Kitab spin liquid there and some kind of a renormalized version of that. We don't know the answer to that, but I think that some of the, uh, what we can only show, I mean, one thing is already there is that uh, we already have long range order on both sides. So we are already away from the Kitab but, and, and then the question is that can we actually extract a very small slither of phase somehow where we can say that, hey, this is, we can expect something which looks like Marana fermions here, is that good enough for us, even with the other interactions present? So um, uh, I think it will renormalize, it will definitely renormalize the situation, but in which, which direction we don't know. Okay, yeah, please. So, like uh, in one of your slides, so one of your slides, uh, you mentioned uh, there is a phase. I mean, there is a reason where spin reorientation is there after zigzag phase. Like, is there a uh, is that a second phase, second order phase transition, or a, just a crossover? It seems like a crossover to us. Yes, yeah, so that's a two Tesla. It it seems like a crossover to us. It's very smooth. Uh, um, now, we did not go there and measure the lattice constants and everything to figure out whether the heat capacity doesn't show anything there. So it's, it, yes, yes. And maybe two more short questions. Hello? Uh, I, I, I think the gap you are measuring is at the gamma point. It's also accessible by ESR. I think there are some measurements by Ziagin's group and so on from many years ago. How do you correlate with, I mean, how, how do you connect the two measurements? Yeah, so uh, from what I understand, and this is something which I have to learn from the community, how ESR really uh, does the measurement. It seems that the, what they measure is a resonance, and, uh, and what you're really looking at is the resonance peak. Now, the peak of all these modes that we are showing, they can be gapped or gapless, but the peak is not right at zero. So something which has a peak at a finite, uh, at a finite energy will look like gapped, in ESR, but might be gapless when you measure it with neutron scattering because you have like residual excitations going all the way to the uh, to zero energy. So you, you, it can still be a zero mode and it can still show a peak in ESR is what we think. So, we, so what I think is that uh, the data, it's not a direct comparison that we can really do. So uh, we have to be careful there. Okay, very short question, Philip. Okay, so then is, are there any questions online? Okay, that doesn't seem to be the case then. Um, so we started five minutes late and then we moved to the next speaker, but let's first thank uh, Anna again for this nice talk. Thank you.